Hey, okay, so we're going to talk about Doc Bashong, the dentist who is also a baseball player. So let's just get into it, shall we? <laughs> so Albert John Bashong. Um, he was born September 15th, 1856 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, he is uh, part of the Bashong family, the colonial Bashong family. And he is one of the few who is a celebrity to the family. Um, I didn't get too much into it while I was researching. No disrespect or anything. Um but the little bit that I was reading was that a family member came over in like the 1750s. And so pretty much, and you can correct me, of course, I have no problem with that. Um, and so uh, the Bashongs are pretty much related to each other. So anybody with the last name of Bashong is they are related so um but again i have no problem with you correcting me i really don't and um but yeah he's he's one of the few that has celebrity status so now he went to public schools in philadelphia uh graduated from central high school in 1876 now uh one thing to understand is that his baseball career started in 1875 and um so there is an overlap here <laughs> um he played in different major and minor league teams uh so professional major and minor league teams and so and it's very spotty I, I I was have that's one of the reasons I was hoping to do this video last month, and you know trying to find all the different uh, teams that he played on, and that was I, that just wasn't possible, <laughs> and, and so nope, just not possible. So yeah, he he actually was playing. Uh, minor leagues while he was in high school and now here's here's where I was getting contradicting information because some places would say that he took a break before going into college like a lot of people do you know instead of charging right into college he decided to take a break and he was playing baseball okay but other places said that he, uh, right after graduating high school in 1876, he went right into college. I don't know which one it is. Um, but he attended, he enrolled in 1876 in dental school at the University of Pennsylvania. And it says that he was one of the first to matriculate <laughs> big words uh in the brand new department of dentistry and he received his dds in 1882 and uh so now this is another thing that i i'm not sure if it's true or not so if if you know, by all means, let, let me know in the comment section, because I was seeing where uh, dentistry, like his father was a dentist and his grandfather was a dentist. And that's why uh, Doc Bashong or Albert John uh, decided to become a dentist. And um, other places were saying, well, he, he was just very passionate about being a dentist. <laughs> Whatever the reason... He got high marks in in uh, college um, because one of the things while I was researching, I actually went to 
the University of Pennsylvania. And of course they have uh, public records, a lot like when I was uh, looking for information for uh, Moulton Taylor at the university here in Washington state. And they had information ab about Moulton, not what I was looking for, but <laughs> well, it was the same thing for uh, Albert John. Uh, I, <laughs> I was hoping to find information about um, any kind of uh, baseball, anything. And um, was he playing for a baseball team or, you know, something like that? And, you know, just to, to debunk any anything that I was seeing, because some places said that he he played for a baseball team. Other places were saying that he didn't, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but they had a lot about his, his grades. <laughs> he was, oh yeah, he was a star student. That's, that's for sure. That is for sure. And um, he's one that mom would be proud of. That's, that's, there's no getting around that. Now, while he attended school, he played professional baseball every year, catching in more than 230 games, as well as what's known as barnstorming. Now, I will put in the description box information about that because I'm not going to go into detail about that. And um, <laughs> no, it's nothing bad or anything. And don't get the wrong idea. But um I feel like I would take too long explaining it, <laughs> go off the rails on that. We know that I'm known for that, but um, so he did that in the off season with um, a team known as the hot bitters. <laughs> I love the team names. I really do. So yeah, I did try to find uh, different teams that he was on, such as like the hot bitters and all that. I, I just, wasn't coming up with anything. So that's why it took so long for me to sit down and do this video is because I was hoping to find uh, like his earlier uh, career. Cause again, there's an overlap here of when he was attending school and, and all of that. So he was the first university of Pennsylvania graduate to play in major league baseball. So that's a big accomplishment right there. Um, he did not play ball for the university as he was already playing professional baseball. Now, before you say, well, it says right there, again, there were a lot of, it was a lot of contradiction. I'm not saying that this person is wrong or anything like that, not by any means at all. I'm not one of those people that's going to do that. <laughs> no, because... Um, there were other people who were saying the same thing. And then there were other people who were saying that he played for the school. So that's why I went on the school's public records to see if he, he played for the school just to get confirmation on that. And um, so that's why, <laughs> no, I would, no, I would never do something like that. Now he got married after graduation to Teresa Gottry. Uh, Goddery, I'm sorry if I say that incorrectly. And they had seven children. And um, so he's he was a family man. Now, after graduation, this is where his baseball career really kicked in. Okay, so let's look at his baseball career. Um, so from 1875 to 1891, he was playing uh, minor and major league teams. Uh, so such as like the Brooklyn Atlantics in, in 1875, Philadelphia Athletics. I wonder if they are the athletics that are current, Oakland Athletics. Because there are a lot of teams that move. You know, like uh, for instance, um, the, the book that I'm working on, that's the 1930s uh, adventure. And the main character is a journalist. And when I was doing some extra research for that, <laughs> San Francisco Giants used to be in New York. They used, New York used to have three teams. I'm sure they had more than that. 
<laughs> uh, Worcester Ruby Lakes. I love it. <laughs> and uh, St. Louis Browns and Brooklyn Bridegrooms. And that's one of my favorites. I love the name. And and um and honestly if you've never seen it before i highly recommend you watch ken burns documentary baseball it is i remember watching it when it first aired on pbs it's it's fantastic it's it's one of his best if not the best documentary he's ever done and um so yeah because he talks about a lot of these he, he starts in the at the very beginning and then goes through up to whenever that was i think that was like 98 somewhere around in there yeah and um and he talks about a lot of these like the ruby legs and, <laughs> and a lot of those and that's how I found out about the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's a really informative, like I said, probably the best documentary he's ever done. So um, if you're a baseball fan and you've never seen it, see it. It's good. <laughs> it's, and um, now... Um, he played on five pennant winning teams and was in the postseason play five times. Uh, now there was what was known as the championship, which was later known as uh, the world series. So they had this big game and um, yeah, the, the first world series was in 1903 and oh man people mobbed that thing there there are pictures i'll i'll put one up here of the um of the field people were just running all over the place and it was uh boston and pittsburgh and the problem is is that boston had who what were called the uh, Boston Rooters. So they had these fans called the boss. Uh, yeah, the Boston Rooters. And, you know, <laughs> Boston is very passionate. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm very aware of this. Yes, Boston is very passionate. And the thing is that the, uh, the cops had their hands full already with people jumping the fences to see this game people who hadn't paid for tickets or anything so they're jumping the fences to come and see this game there are pictures of people um climbing telephone poles or you know random poles that are nearby to see this game <laughs> because and because the Boston team at that time, and I can't think, I think they were called the Boston Americans at the, at that time were the champs. I mean, they were unstoppable. Right. And so the problem is the Boston rooters were inciting riots in the stands. They were inciting riots outside the stadium. They were, so the cops had to deal with that too. <laughs> Yeah, there were there were fist fights going on. And so yeah. <laughs> so that was the first World Series in 1903. That was 120 years ago. Wow. <laughs> Good heavens. But before that there was the championship. Before it was called the World Series. Now, um when he in 1886 when uh Bashong was on the uh, St. Louis Browns, his performance, uh, he helped them beat the Chicago White Stockings. And because of this, 
the Missouri Pacific Railroad honored uh, Doc Bashong as well as several other players by renaming some of their whistle stop towns. Uh, the town of Weeks in Kansas became known as Bashong, Kansas. So those of you in Kansas, <laughs> and that was in 1886 when they changed it. What used to be Weeks is now Bashong, named after the baseball player. Um, the next year in 1887, uh, Bashong became one of the first baseball players to do uh, paid product endorsements. Uh, there was a advertisement for Merrill's Penetrating Oil, which was a cold medicine. It doesn't sound like a cold medicine. I, I... <laughs> Every time I would read it, I'm like, that. it doesn't sound like what it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't i apologize for giggling oh good heavens uh and it's a cure-all for a long list of ailments uh for aches and pains and um such as rheumatism sprains stiff joints Lame back. Oh, yeah, this really does sound like an 1880s. <laughs> Toothache pains in the limbs or pains in any part of the system penetrating to the very bone. Oh, well, now it, now it sounds, yeah, now it makes more sense. Uh, good for horses, too. <laughs> oh. But you know what? Okay. I mean, we can laugh now, but you do have to understand that something like that was, uh, you know, like snake oils like this was marketed to farmers. So, of course, they're going to want something like that. So, yeah, we can laugh now, but yeah. You, you... <laughs> and yes, we, we giggle at the, the name. I did <laughs> every time, but um, I wonder how well it worked. And uh, he received a contract uh, for the, uh, let's see, for the 88 season. He made news again because of the amount of his contract which was uh, $19,000 at the time for uh, himself and two other people. And uh, so, yeah, that that's big for the 1880s. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a huge chunk of change. Uh, let's see, who are the other two people? Let's see, he made news again when the owner of the St. Louis Browns sold the contract for him along with pitcher uh, Parisian Bob Carruthers and first baseman outfield pitcher uh, Dave Fouts. The sale was to the Brooklyn Bridegrooms who paid what was then the enormous sum of $90,000 for the trio. Uh, how many pitchers did they have, I wonder? And did they get another one? Because, because again, this is a, a first baseman outfield pitcher. Doc Bashong was a catcher, so that's that's interesting. Now, in 1889, he injured his arm. Uh. And from what I was reading, he 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 never recovered from that. It, it was an injury that he just it it never fully healed. And um, yeah, his playing was limited 
never fully recovered from the injury. And in 1890, the season was his last in the major leagues. He was released on March 26, 1891 from the majors. He wasn't quite ready to give it up. He played one more season. Um, yeah, his injury had robbed him of his throwing strength and speed. He didn't complete the season and was released July of 1891, ending his baseball career. He had played for 15 years. And um, so, yeah, that's tough. I mean, <laughs> injuries are one of those things that are like a death wish, to be honest. I mean, I remember when I was, uh, gosh, how old was I? And I broke my ankle. And and everybody was like, oh, it's just a fracture. I'm like, no, it, it broke. <laughs> it broke. I, the pain and everything tells me it broke. Okay. And, and everything. And it just, yeah. So, and I mean, it healed okay, but still, it just, man. Now, here's the other thing about his career in baseball is that the catcher's mitt. Okay. Now he had a hand in the catcher's mitt and um, one thing to understand is that it was played barehanded. And uh, again, this is, you got to think of the time. <laughs> were the were the throws like ninety miles an hour, like they are now? <laughs> I just remember. Oh shoot, who was that? Oh, it's Randy Johnson. And and Randy Johnson, his pitches were just oh my gosh. And I felt so bad for him when he pitched that one time and that bird exploded. Because you could tell that he was shaken by that. And, and like, there were people that, I think that was one that PETA tried to go after him or something. And it's like, right, okay, that's like the dumbest thing you could ever do. And <laughs> as if, I don't know, well, anyway, but yeah, he... And it seems like he stepped away for a while because it just, it messed him up and everything. But yeah, Randy Johnson, he, his throws were dangerous, man. <laughs> they, they were scary. And, um, but yeah, in the Victorian era, they weren't that fierce. Not at all. Not even close. But still, <laughs> the idea that you were catching something like that barehanded, your your hands had to be bruised. <laughs> In fact, when I was researching about this and hearing that about how they had broken fingers and everything. Well, of course they were going to have broken fingers, you know, if the, the ball bounced off of your hand and everything. Yeah. It just. Owie. <laughs> Big old owie. And so. This is the thing to understand, first of all, is that there were people who were trying to give uh, Doc Bushong full credit for the catcher's mitt. You can't do that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it's, because you just can't, okay? These two references that I'm using say 
it's difficult to say who was first to make and use the padded catcher's mitt that is similar to today's glove. I mean, this was even, um, this was something that I came across because in the, in the book that I wrote, I uh, was researching boxers gloves, the, the padded boxers gloves. And again, when I was trying to find the inventor of the, the padded boxers, glove, it's, it's the same kind of deal, you know, <laughs> people wanted to give this person, people wanted to give that person, people wanted to, and so again, um, it's the same kind of a deal. Uh, it says that the first player to wear a glove was uh, catcher Doug Allison in 1870. Then in 1888, Joe Gunson described his catcher's mitt and is sometimes associated with its invention. And so he's associated with it along with Doc Bashong, as well as other inventors slash baseball players. Um, his claim as first is brought into question by a Brooklyn Eagle article that describes Bashong with his special glove at least a season before Gunson's claim. Uh, on, but on July 1st, 1887, while at bat in the sixth inning of a game against Louisville, Bashong's fingers were mashed by a wild pitch. That's what I was talking about. Um, the injury resulted in a broken finger and prevented him from playing for almost 10 and a half weeks. But it is easy to believe that on September 18th, 1887, when he returned, Bashong had, ser had seriously padded a mitt to protect his hand as well his dentistry profession. Yeah, that was something that I came across a lot was that uh, Doc Bashong, while being a catcher, which... Catcher didn't seem to fit for him because <laughs> he wanted to protect his hands. Otherwise, it would destroy his career as a dentist. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I just, um, let's see. So an article by the Brooklyn Eagle tells of Bashong losing his old glove. He feels badly over the matter. It was padded and fixed up until it was as soft as his hands as a pillow. Yeah, pretty much um, the the bare bones of it is that uh, it was like having a mattress on his hand uh, is, is the whole thing about it. Uh, so his old judge baseball cards show him with thick gloves on both hands, but... Uh, a magazine describes his met as a spring mattress on his left hand. Yeah. Uh, in the end, most agree that Bashong certainly deserves credit in the evolution of the catcher's met. So they really don't know who uh, many believe that he was its primary inventor, but I, you know, even I wouldn't say that he is. I mean, obviously, he was trying to protect his hands so that he could still do dentist work. And, um, but I think that a lot of the, uh, the invention work has to do with all of the catchers of the day together. And, um, because again, barehanded and then you're hurting yourself you're getting bruised hands broken fingers everything and you know and so yeah I, you know sprained fingers even what have you you're getting injured hands <laughs> so i would say that that the inventor would be all of them put together not just one person in this case and um, it's probably the same thing when I, you know, for the, the boxing glove, you know, and um, 
but anyway, yeah, I, I wouldn't put it. Yeah. I, I think him putting the padding in there was just to save his hands for the, the dentistry. So after he retired, because again, <laughs> He retired from baseball. He was 33 years old when he retired um, and practiced dentistry full time. Uh, he had a dental parlor in Hoboken, New Jersey, and worked with his uh, brothers, his two younger brothers. Uh, he became the manager of the establishment. And while working in Hoboken, he began and, according to uh, a historian, built up a large and flourishing practice. Um, eventually, his surviving sons, as well as a nephew, also became Brooklyn dentists. Maybe that's where the family uh, practice came in. Uh, it was his brothers, as well as his sons and, and nephew, not his dad and, and grandfather, as I said earlier in the video. Um, now, on... So with his family business and everything going on August 19th, 1908, Albert Jong Bashong died of cancer at his home in Brooklyn at the age of 51. And he was uh, buried in New York. Um. Now, there was a, a scandal that he was a part of. <laughs> Some of those scandals from the 1880s aren't very, you know, uh, <laughs> exciting, but I'll go ahead and I'll mention it. Uh, so there was a minor scandal that he was a part of at, for the 1889 World Series, again, the championship, and uh it followed the bridegroom series loss to the New York Giants, six games to three, uh, a telegram from uh, Bashong to the Giants catcher uh, was revealed, which states, oh, let's see, uh, catcher St. Louis Baseball Club, uh, friend Jack. Hope you will answer the telegram I sent you, which was that I'll give you $200 for your share in our agreement. It will be a personal favor to me, if you will. And besides, we'll be sure, will be a sure thing for you. And yet, give me a chance to make a little. Don't lose your chance, as you did with Tucker. Reply instantly at my expense. AJ Bashong. Uh... The scheme involved a 400 prize to the individual winners of the series. The prize had been offered by a chewing gum firm, like the Green and Blackwell Company of New York, known as G&B Chewing Gum Company, who in 1888 were first to issue gum with their baseball cards. <laughs> uh, Bashong's idea was prize sharing, where... Before the actual games, they were to agree whoever the winner, whoever was the winner would split the prize with the loser. In the newspapers, it was briefly mentioned as cheating, even though the practice was common in numerous sports, had been around in baseball for over a decade. Though embarrassed over the affair, nothing more came of it and Bashan continued playing. Yeah, it, it, it really isn't anything. <laughs> yeah. They embarrassed him, and that's about it. I mean, and they embarrassed the other guy. Uh, what, what's his name? Uh, uh, well, he had the uh, Milligan or whatever it was. Yeah, it, it's more of an embarrassing case of you got caught, and it didn't really hurt anybody. So, 
and and they tried to say that it was a big old cheating thing but yeah it didn't nothing like the the uh, scandal you know where um with like shoeless joe jack that that whole thing yeah no which i yeah anyway <laughs> i don't want to get into that but yeah so it wasn't anything really but um so anyway uh that is <laughs> um as he put it aj bashong <laughs> dentistry was his passion uh, i have seen where people say that dentistry was more of a hobby it wasn't <laughs> he he, did, he obviously enjoyed baseball and um when it comes to the catcher's mitt i'm going to give credit to everybody who who tried to uh perfect it you know i, I mean <laughs> Again, it's one of those things where you're catching barehanded, you're getting tired of getting bruised hands and broken fingers and bruised, you know, whatever. So, yeah, everybody deserves credit on that, including Bashong. And when it comes to Bashong, Kansas, your town is named after this gentleman. So, <laughs> so anyway, yes, this is Doc Bashong. <laughs>